so much. Good evening, everyone. How are you today? It's good to see you again tonight in the second part of our series, Why Are We Still Here? Why are we really still here? We have learned last night that there's one thing that still needs to happen in order that Jesus would come, and that is no other than the what? The Sunday law. We are waiting for the Sunday law, yet the Sunday law is waiting for us. How could they Im implement Sunday law if they could not still see in us Adventism? That's why we need to prepare upon these events that is about to take place in the end time. We need to proclaim it by our lives, the Adventism in which we believe in. Tonight, we are going to continue it. One of the important events that needs to take place, and it is very urgent and it's very needed in the church as we prepare for the soon coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Tonight, we are going to talk about what we need in this end time. And the title of the message is, No Umbrellas Needed. It's the second coming of the Holy Spirit. No Umbrellas Needed. My dear brothers and sisters, there are things in life that need not to be put off for tomorrow, but it needs to happen today. There's no such thing that we need to delay because there's still plenty of time. But we need to make sure that our preparation day by day in the soon coming of our Lord Jesus Christ would always be made necessary day by day. The coming of Jesus Christ may be delayed, but the preparation for his soon return should never be delayed. It should be day by day. Before we talk about these things tonight with regards to the second coming of the Holy Spirit, I ask the Holy Spirit to guide us as we talk about these things and may He illumine our mind as we start our topic tonight. Shall we bow our heads for the prayer? Heavenly Father, I am your servant and I need your spirit to guide me tonight. Use me mightily. May your words alone be heard and may your will be known as we open your word tonight. O oh, Father God in heaven, it is my prayer that you may touch the heart of each one of us tonight. It is my prayer that may we experience you deeper tonight. It is my prayer, dear loving Father, that you may pour out your spirit in this, in this meeting tonight. May your presence be sensed tonight, dear loving Father, by each of us worshiping you. And may this worship be a sweet-smelling savor in your holy throne of grace. May this experience help us never be the same again. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We know that Matthew 24 is talking about the signs of Jesus coming. And he is telling us what needs to take place before Jesus come. Matthew 24 tells the sign of his coming, while Matthew 25, as to the parable of the ten virgins, is talking about the preparation that is necessary for his second coming. Matthew 24 talks about what? The fulfillment of the signs in the world, but Matthew 25 is talking about the fulfillment that needs to take place in the church. Matthew 24 tells us what happened out there, while Matthew 25 tells us what happens in here. And it's all talk talking about 
the last days, the, soon com- the preparation for the soon coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew 24 is talking about the world, while Matthew 25 is talking about our necessary preparations. That's why you have the three parables in Matthew 25. And it's, it's really talking about His soon return because you will find that all of this parable is talking about then likened unto a kingdom of God. My friends, if it is talking about with this word, then liking unto the kingdom of God, it is talking personally to the church. It is for the church. Now, I would like to ask something. Jesus is trying to say that we need to be prepared in the last days. And we need to be prepared for the soon coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now the question is, when does the last day start? Do you know when does the last day started? With regards to our eschatology, when indeed the last day began? And here we can find in the Bible where we can see the beginning of the last days. And it is found in Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1, here we could find when does the last day begin? And it says here, Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. It says here, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the what? Prophets. But I would like you to notice this. Had in the when? Had in these last days spoken unto us by who? By his son, whom he had appointed heirs of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Here we can find that the beginning of the last days is when, what? It is when Jesus came here on this earth for the first time. So in other words, from the first coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, going to the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, is talking about the last days. And now we could see all of those that have been that has been talking about that has been talked about in Matthew 24 are being fulfilled in our very own eyes at this moment and this generation in our time today. And can you can you see now that the urgency that the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ is very, very near? And don't you know that Matthew 25 is telling us the spiritual condition of the church while waiting of the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now let us go back to the parable in which we derive our series. And that is found in Matthew 25. Here now we could start it in verse 23, verse 3 up to verse 10. Have you brought your Bibles with you? Okay. Open it to Matthew 25, verses 3 up to 10. It says here, They that were what? Foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, there was a what? A cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But I think you could go rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Have you noticed here that the parable of the ten virgin is differentiating as wise and foolish? It's not differentiating obedient and disobedient, faithful and unfaithful, loyal and rebellious, but rather it is saying what? Wise and foolish virgins. 
What is the importance of this parable of the ten virgins nowadays in our time? I would like you to notice what he, Review and Herald, August 19, 1890, has mentioned. And it says here, I am often referred to the what? Parable of the ten virgins, five of whom are wise and five foolish. This parable has been what? Has been and will be fulfilled to the very letter, for it has a special application to when? To when? To this time. And like the third angel's message has been fulfilled and will continue to be present truth till the close of time. Now it only talks about, it only tells us that the situation and the parable of the ten virgins will be true and it has a special application in our time today. In our time. Now let us go back to verse 1. It says here that they are how many virgins? Ten virgins. You would notice why ten, not twelve, not seven, not three, not four. Why not twelve? Talking about you know, what? Uh, completeness. Why not seven? Talking about perfection. Why not four? Talking about universality. But it talks about ten. Because in the Jewish tradition, you can have ten. You could have the list ten Jewish men that could establish a synagogue. So therefore, it really implies that it is what? For the church. It is for the church. But you would notice that it's not just ten, but it now give the, gave the now. There are ten what? Virgins. Why virgins? In the Bible, when it talks about virgins, it's not just a pure woman, but it also talks about a young woman. But basically what it's trying to point here is a pure woman. Why ten pure women? And yet, they were described as wise and then foolish? Why so? I would like you to notice the meaning. Why are they called ten virgins? It says in Christ Object Lessons, page 407, and it says here, they are called virgins because they what? Profess a pure faith. They profess a pure faith. These are not the people who are not reading their Bibles. These are not the people who are not going to church, not even going to the worship hall. And in time of worship, these are not those people that the Bible is talking about. This is talking indeed. The what? People who confess pure faith. Who confess pure faith. But don't you know that you could not see the difference on the onset why they are called wise and then foolish? You could not see the difference. But what made, what made the difference is because of the waiting time. You know what? I ponder more and more upon the parable of the ten virgins, and it says that these are people who have regard with the truth. They are professing pure faith. They are what? Enjoying. They are jo enjoying the fellowship of those who are active in the church. They are the people who are in these meetings like this. So shall we say, we could be one of those. And as I pondered even deeper, I asked God, Lord, could it be possible that I could be one of the foolish virgin? Could I be one of those who are enjoying the presence of the righteous virgins, of the wise virgins? being in the church, being active in the ministry, but yet still called as foolish virgins. 
Lord, even I, as I'm speaking about these things, could it be possible, dear God, that I am a foolish virgin? I hope that you would ponder upon those thoughts. But what separated them to be called wise and then foolish virgin? It's about the delay of time. It's about the delay. Don't you know that they are being separated because of the waiting time? Their status were made clear because of time. As in the days of Noah, it's also what? With the, with the status of time. How many years? 120 years. Could you just imagine proclaiming the gospel for 120 years? Whew. I could have died by those years right now. But it's trying to say that it is upon the waiting time, upon the delay, that it differentiates the wise and the foolish virgin. That's why it is no wonder that God says that what? By the endurance or here's the patience of the saints. And those who will what? Endure until the end shall be saved. Hmm. Don't you know that the same thing also as we look upon Mr. Right, it takes time. Right? Sometimes it takes delay. <laughs> and then we thought to ourselves, Lord, I'm already graduating. Thinking that there will be scarcity of Mr. Right. <laughs> and we hasten Mr. Right, but in the wrong time and in the wrong place. Don't you know why God sometimes delay Mr. Right? It's because we might not be in the right place. We might be looking from the wrong place, from the wrong person. So it's the same thing with this situation as we look upon the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We might be one of those Jews who are still looking for the first coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, not the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because they have seen the timing, but they were not able to see the events. They know that Jesus is coming, but what they are looking for is still the first coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. There is a delay. There is a delay. Now, Matthew 25 verse 8 says that it is the very thing that also differentiate them. It's not just the delay, but upon that delay, there has been a preparation that they have done. Could you notice that in verse 8 it says there, don't what? And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. In other words, their oils were not prepared prior to the event. Now, what is the representation of oil? What is the meaning of oil? It's the Holy Spirit, as of Zechariah 4, 3 to 6, you will you'll find there that not by might nor by my power, but by the Holy Spirit. It is talking about the two olive trees in which we could find the symbol of what oil represents. But I would like you to notice also why God used the symbol of oil instead of fire. It's also the symbol of the Holy Spirit, right? Why not water? But rather, he used oil. It could be water. But don't you know that in the Old Testament time, there are, the oil is associated with three things. And it has meanings with it. Number one is this. The oil is associated in the sanctuary. When the sanctuary is inaugurated, what? They pour out oil to anoint it even to the priests. They anointed the oil. Oil represents what? Consecration. Consecration, it is a total commitment to the kingdom of God. That's why we say, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all, and it's what? Righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. We have a total commitment to God. That is the meaning of consecration. Number two, another association of oil in the Old Testament is healing. Why does God would give the oil to His church? Because He wants the church to be healed. To be healed by what? 
to be healed within of inner attitudes. There must be pride in us. There must be jealousy. There must be what? There must be things in ourselves, in our hearts that is corrupting us, that is eating us up, and it needs to be healed. That's why God needs the oil for each one of us to be healed, to be made whole. And last but not the least is this. Illumination. What does the meaning of illumination in other words, God wants a church. God is preparing a church in the end times that will what? Raise the torch high, the torch light to pave the way of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? God is looking for people who will prepare the way of the Lord, who will be paving, who will be having their torch light, lighting the way for the soon coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, not putting people in darkness, but rather getting them from darkness into his marvelous light. In other words, there will be a people that will, that will be filled with the Holy Spirit, that will be consecrated to Him. These are the people who are not interested of those what they are doing, but rather they are interested on only one thing, that is the finishing of God's work. And they are thinking of what God can do rather than what they can do. Do these are the people who will witness to his grace? These are a people who are consumed with holding a light and torch of truth to get ready for the soon coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And this is talking about the church. This is talking about the church. What's, what does the lamp represent? Psalm 119, 105 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Basically, it is talking about what? The word of God. Lamp represents the word of God. In other words, when you, when you mix the lamp and then the oil, you could have what? The fire. You could have the light. In other words, when we are reading the Word of God without the Holy Spirit, it is in vain. It is in vain. We could not produce light. Can you just imagine? Lord, okay, and you're reading the Bible as if to a lamp but without oil. And then you're what? Flickering the light. Okay, Lord, please light it up now. Light it up without the Holy Spirit. Our reading of the Word of God will be in vain. That's why we need the Holy Spirit to illumine us. And it is also mentioned that they need to trim their lamps. What does it mean to trim our lamps? My brothers and my sisters, don't you know that it's very important to trim our lamps day by day? Because it says here, in letter 119, 1899, it says here, that the very credentials we can carry is what? Love for one another. All strife, all dissension is to cease. God will not accept the talents of the smallest, even the, the most eloquent man, if the inner lamp of the soul is not trimmed and burning. There must be a what? Consecrated heart and consecrated surrender of the soul. We need to be trimming our lamps and burning it. Trimming our lamps and burning it. We need consecration of soul. But you will find now that in this situation, in the parable of the Ten Virgin, the scarcity went on. And that is when the emergency came and they were found having scarcity in the emergency. You would notice that, that they are what? Begging, please give us oil, give us oil. Why they could not share their oil? Right? It could be possible that they could give the half of the oil and then the half would be to the foolish. Why is it that they could not share the oil? You know why? You know why, my friends? Because we could not share our Holy Spirit experience. 
your devotional life could not be given by another one. It could not be experienced by another one, but it will be yours personally. It will be yours personally. Not, not my experience will be experienced by Moana. Because the oil will be an per, a personal experience with the Holy Spirit. That's why they could not share the oil. They could not share the oil. And don't you know that in this situation, it could also be called the leaky bucket theory. Why? Because it says there that the foolish were not prepared for the delay. They have what? They have they've been confident for their own selves, for what they have. You know what is the leaky bucket theory? What is the leaky bucket principle? It's this. Don't you know that we usually have leaky bucket principle? This is thinking you're right or thinking that we are right, yet we are wrong. Hmm, what does that mean, Brother Rovel? You're speaking in parables again. What, does the what is the meaning of leaky bucket theory? This is the meaning. I would like to give you a scenario. We usually go to class and then have our notebooks and pen with us. When we go to class, we are jotting notes, we are taking down notes with all those things that we are what? Seeing in the blackboards or in the whiteboards or in the presentation. And then thinking that all those things that we accumulated will be what? Will really be stored in our knowledge or in our minds. But we don't recognize that every day it is leaking and leaking and leaking. That's why when we go to the examination, when it is examination time, what, what happens? We are preparing or somehow we go to the examination thinking, okay, I can make this because I could have my stock knowledge. But unfortunately, when we go to the examination, our knowledge has stocked. That is what the leaky bucket principle means. We think that it could be sufficient for the examination time. We think that our knowledge will be sufficient in the examination time. But we don't recognize that it is leaking day by day. That's why we need to review it. We need to prepare for it day by day. Don't you know that that is the very thing that separates the wise and the foolish virgin? We think that we have enough. We think that it is sufficient that we have our Bible study before. We think that it's sufficient that we have our camp, our camp meeting before, our youth camp before, our week of prayer, thinking that that is enough. But we don't recognize that every day it is leaking and leaking and leaking. That's why we need to trim our lambs. We need to trim our lambs. Don't you know that also in crisis, our characters are revealed because another representation of oil is our what? Character. It's our character when we are being poured out with the Holy Spirit. It can manifest now the Holy Spirit in us and it's not producing the fruits of the Spirit and it's not producing the right character in us. But you know what? Usually in the emergency, in the crisis, that is when our character is really revealed. When things are so fine and so good, we could boldly say, praise the Lord. Hey, sister, girl. Girl, praise the Lord. Okay lang yan. Bumagsak as exam. Okay lang yan. Praise the Lord. Huh? But you know what? When you also experience it, you will be the one crying also. <laughs> and then they will say to you, praise the Lord, girl. <laughs> oh, come on. What would happen to you? Well, actually, in those crises, in those trying times, it's so hard to praise the Lord, right? But don't you know that in those times, our character will really be revealed. Our character will will really be revealed. How much do we trust God when we failed? How much do we trust God when these things did not come up to what we thought of? When our financial assistance failed, could we still praise God? When we are reaching the bars of the top 10, 
most, <laughs> ano tawag dito? Most credited person? Ano, ano tawag? Having the, the outstanding utang of the campus. No? You could be part of the top ten. Could you still praise God? Whew. But in those crises, our character will really be revealed. That is why, that is when the wise and the foolish were differentiated. Now in the crisis, what, how are we acting? Don't you know that it is because of the delay, it's because of the time? That's why the character has been tested. Why God made a delay? What are the reasons that Jesus delayed His coming, that God delayed His coming? Don't you know that there's a reason? The reasons, there are three reasons why God delayed His coming. It says here in Matthew 25 verse 5, while the bridegroom tarried, he really tarried, right? He really tarried. What are the reasons why the bridegroom tarried? Number one reason is this. Christ waits in love. Why? Christ waits in love. In other words, Christ suffered. Christ is also suffering in spite of the pain, in spite of the death that He sees day by day, in spite of the diseases, the disappointments, the discouragement, the besetments that are hurled upon us. Christ could see us. He is also suffering when we are suffering. But Christ waits in love. Christ waits in love even in our pain, in our agony, in our sorrow, in our poverty, in our sickness, and at the death of the world, Christ is waiting in love. What is waiting is the proclamation of the gospel into all the world with all power so all humanity will have an opportunity to be Safe, and we can find that in 2 Peter 3, verse 9. 2 Peter 3, verse 9, it mentions here what? The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, Lord, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to Repentance, He doesn't want you to perish. He doesn't want you to die eternally, but rather He wants you to be with Him forever. Christ waits in love. Desire of Ages 633, paragraph 3, it says here, Had the church, had the church, had the church of Christ done her appointed work as the Lord ordained, the whole world would before this have been warned and the Lord Jesus would have come to our earth in power and great glory. But Christ still waits in love in spite that we failed to proclaim the gospel with all its glory. Christ is so merciful. Christ is long-suffering. He wants us all to be with Him forever. To be with Him in that heavenly mansion. Number two, why God delays His coming. Number two reason is this. Christ waits that His character will be revealed to of love. Or His character of love will be revealed to a waiting and a watching universe. God longs for His church. God longs for His church to reveal that His way brings joy and happiness. And Satan's way leads death and sadness. And destruction. God is trying to proclaim, God is trying to show us that the direction of God is for life eternal, that the direction of Satan is for what? Death eternal. He wants us to see his character of love. He wants us to see that. And it says here in Christ's object lesson 69, paragraph 1, Christ is waiting with longing desire. For the manifestation of himself in his church. When the, church, when the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. He wants to what? Reveal his character in us. What you love before, you will hate now. What you hate before, you will love now. God wants to what? Reproduce his character in us so that he will come. He could claim now all of his people. As his own. He will bring them to his own. 
But there is one more thing that needs to happen. And you know what is that? That is no other than the convergence of wickedness in the end time. It needs to happen. It needs to happen that there will be a manifestation of the wickedness, the rebellion, the selfishness of sin that will bring devastation and destruction to the world. Christ waits not only to reveal His love and character for His people, but, uh, but also he, he must let wickedness be seen and all its cause so that the universe will see the result of Satan's rebellion. They could see what He has done. They could see His character. There will be a convergence. There will be convergence of wickedness. But on the other hand, praise be to God. You know why? Because at the same time, there will also be a convergence of prayerful people. There will be a convergence of people who will go back to the Bible. There will be a people who will be what? Going back to their consecration to God. There will be a people that will prepare themselves to the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. There will be people that will cleanse their hearts in an unusual ways. So that they can be everything that God wants them to be. And Satan sees that these things are taking place in the church. And he redoubles his efforts. And then you will find that sin will find its limitation. And God will say, this is enough. I need to come. I need to redeem now my people. This is enough. This is enough. I could not bear this any longer. I need to bring my people home. I need to bring my people home. But how could this happen? How could this happen, my dear brothers and sisters? You will find that in Revelation 18, verse 1. It says here, Revelation 18, verse 1, And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having what? Great power. Don't you know that the power here, it's not the might or the dunamis in Greek word, but rather it is the exosio. Exosia, which means authority. And what is that great, great authority? And then the earth was lightened with his glory what would be the illumination of god's glory in the world you will find that in isaiah 60 verses 1 to 2 you will see also that the convergence of wickedness will rise will rise even higher and then you will see also at the same time the convergence of the light of the people that will be bearing their torchlight paving the way of our lord jesus coming and it says here, Arise, shine, for the light is come, and the what? The glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the what? The darkness shall cover the earth, and the gross darkness, darkness the people, but the Lord shall, ar shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. He is really preparing his people for the soon coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But how could this happen? That is when we will be illumined by the light of God's glory through the working of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And that is no other than what we call the outpouring of God's Holy Spirit in us so that this world of darkness will be illumined by His glory. But we need to have first the early reign with us, my dear brothers and sisters. Why do farmers need early rain? You know what before? Before they, when they are having, when they're going farming, they need to have first the early rain. What is the meaning of early rain? That is when they need the ground to what? To break and to swell so that the seed could go deeper. Hmm. In other words, God is trying to prepare us. God is trying to prepare us for His soon coming. And yet we need first to what? Have a parch. We need that our ground be breaking, be swelling, so that His seed, 
We'll go deeper. We'll go deeper. And that is no other than the Word of God. The truth that we are receiving. It needs to go deeper. It needs to go deeper. Why it needs to go deeper? So that we could be prepared for the what? For the process of that farming. And then it will prepare us for the second rain. And that is no other than the latter rain. And that is now to prepare the farm, to the field for the harvest. Are you now seeing the point here, my dear brothers and sisters? It only tells us, it only tells us that unless we are preparing for the second coming of the Holy Spirit, we will never be ready for the second coming of Jesus Christ. We need the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in our time. We need the second coming of the Holy Spirit to prepare us for the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. It says here in Review and Herald, March 2, 1897, we are not to trust to the ordinary working of providence. In other words, the latter rain could not come by just what? Receiving it. Ah, let's just worship and then we will receive it. No, we need not to trust upon ordinary working of providence, but rather we what? We must pray that God will unseal the fountain of the water of life and we must ourselves receive, the, receive of the living water. Let us with contrite hearts pray most earnestly that when, now, in the time of the latter rain, the showers of grace, amen? The show, I love that word, the showers of grace may fall upon us at every meeting we attend. In this worship that we attend, we need to pray for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. In every meeting that we attend, our prayers should ascend that at this very time, God will impart warmth and moisture to our souls. As we seek God for the Holy Spirit, it will work in us meekness, humbleness of mind, a conscious dependence upon God for the perfecting latter rain. If we prepare for the blessing of faith, we shall receive it as God has promised. We shall receive it as God has promised. But don't you know the problem of the foolish virgin? And I pray to God, Lord, may I not also play the part of the foolish virgin. In which I thought to myself, I had some oil, but it's not enough. I thought that the limited supply of oil would be sufficient enough. Number three is that I thought that the oil is not sufficient for the unanticipated delay. You know what? That has been the problem of the foolish virgin. They thought that what they had experienced in the Word of God is enough. What they are praying to God is enough. Their prayer experience is enough. But my dear brothers and sisters, I would like you to ponder upon these things. Are we also, could we also be found as one of the foolish virgins? Let us think upon these things. Are we depending on our experience with Jesus Christ that once had, that we once had? Or is our spiritual lamp going out? Are we de depending on an experience with God that is in the past tense and not in a continuous tense? Are we, do our hearts still burn with us when we open the Word of God? Are we still excited when we open the Word of God? Or also when we pray, are we still excited to hear the Word of God? Or it just become a ceremony, as a ritual, not an experience anymore? Do we really know Jesus Christ? Are we convicted? Are we just convicted and not changed? Are we spending much time with Jesus Christ? Are we laying all our time? Are we giving our time to no more our lover, Jesus Christ? Do we still sense His presence when we come in Him in prayer? Or our prayer life become boring and ritualistic or something we're hurried to a ceremony? Do we still love to take those walk and then pondering upon the creation of God? 
I honestly would like to confess to you that I miss my sunrise moments with the Lord. That's why I'm pondering, Lord, could I be found as also one of the foolish virgins? I am trying to make time again and again for, for the date that I usually had every morning going in the breezeway and then have time with God. Could that be sufficient enough in my preparation for His soon return? But you know what, my dear brothers and sisters? The Lord is merciful because there is an incredible good news. Though we are failing, though we are failing in our Holy Spirit experience, though we are preparing in a preparation for the soon coming of the Holy Spirit and then prepare us for the soon coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, there is abundant supply of heaven's oil for you and for me. There is no shortage of the power of the Holy Spirit. God is moving to His people today. He will bring revival. He will bring renewal. He will bring reformation in our time today because His power will never find its shortage. And that will be sufficient for each one of us, my dear brothers and sisters. And at this time, at this time, isn't it time to pause? Isn't it time to pause to, to recognize, to recognize that our grounds, that our hearts are also parched with the need of Jesus Christ? With the need of Jesus Christ. And it says in Isaiah 44 verse 3. Isaiah 44 verse 3, and it says here, For I, the good news, my dear brothers and sisters, is that when we have the parts of need of Jesus Christ, He has promised, For I will pour out water upon him that is thirsty, and floods upon the dry ground, I will pour my spirit upon thy seed and bless and my blessing upon offspring. Amen. God is preparing us for the soon coming of the Holy Spirit as He's preparing us more and more for the soon coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Don't you know that we, when we receive the outpouring of the latter rain, this is a scenario in which there will be no umbrellas needed. It will be a rain that you would like it to pour with you. We need not anything that will come between us and the Holy Spirit, but rather let it rain, letting it rain in us, letting it rain in us, letting the Holy Spirit fill us. And it says here in First Selected Messages, First Selected Messages, it says here, There is nothing... There's nothing that Satan fears so much. What? There's nothing that Satan has fears so much as that the people of God shall clear the way by removing every hindrance so that the Lord can pour out His Spirit upon a languishing church and an impenitent congregation. If Satan had his way, there would never be another awakening, great or small, to the end of time. But we are not ignorant of his devices. Amen? It is possible to resist his power. Would you be glad with that? It is possible that we could resist his power when the way is prepared for the Spirit of God. The blessing will come. The blessing will indeed come. Satan can no more hinder a shower of blessing from descending upon God's people then he can close the windows of heaven that the rain cannot come upon the earth. Wicked men and devils cannot hinder the work of God or shut out his presence from the assemblies of his people. If they will, with subdued, contrite hearts, confess and put away their sins and in faith claim his promises. I love the last line. Every temptation, every opposing influence, whether open or secret, may be successfully rested, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, said the Lord of hosts. We need the outpouring of the latter rain in our time. 
we need no umbrellas. We need it to rain in us. And you know what? The only way to prepare is to get ready now and to stay ready. My dear brothers and sisters, it is time. It is time to think seriously about going home. It is time to think seriously about going home. It is time. It is time. It is time. Me, Holy Spirit, bid my trembling heart and brow fill me with thy hallowed presence. Friends, some of you may have sensed the touch of God tonight. And maybe some of you will be really called or found as one of the foolish virgins. It might be that your devotional life with God has slipped away. It might be that your prayer life just seems to be ritual. It might be that as your Bible study seems to be very boring. It might be you, my dear brother, my dear sister. You might be thinking that it's not the church that needs revival. But it's your heart that needs revival and that needs reformation. At this moment, I call upon you. I would not like to ask you to come here in front. But if God is inspiring you to talk to Him at this moment and ask the Holy Spirit to prepare you for His soon return at this moment, I ask you to please kneel and talk to your God. As you will be hearing the third stanza, you could start, you could start talking to God as you sense him speaking to you. I would not force you, but do it as how the Holy Spirit 
will guide you. Continue to talk to God as you ask Him to cleanse and comfort. Bless and save me, dear Father. And then you could also ask to bait and bait your heart and brow so that then you will have the comforting and saving grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be poured out to you. And may He sweetly fill you now. Fill you now. Heavenly Father, you are now hearing your sons and daughters this moment of time. Begging for your Holy Spirit to bathe and save us. Because we have recognized, dear Lord, that we sometimes are like the foolish virgins. But we thank you because we could be wise virgins by your grace and by your spirit. You have promised it, dear loving Father. And we could claim because the one who has promised is faithful to fulfill it in us. And you have also mentioned, dear God, that you who began the good work will also finish it until you come for the second time. Oh, dear Father, Someone, someone here, their Lord, needs your revival. Someone here needs your reformation. Someone here needs your renewal, their loving Father. I pray that you may embrace her now, that you may embrace him now. May he experience, may she experience your Holy Spirit being poured out in her at this moment. Embracing her, lifting her soul unto your hand. May your sweet presence continually linger and dwell within our lives, dear loving Father, from now on. Help us to get ready now and stay ready until you come. And nonetheless, dear loving Father, help us to think seriously, to come and thinking seriously about going home with you in that heavenly mansion. Seal now our prayers, dear Lord, as you seal us with your Holy Spirit. This I pray in the precious name of our crucified, risen, and soon coming Lord and Savior, 
Jesus Christ, let all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Amen.